In this lecture, we're going to talk about Texas's place and role in the Civil War, and in the next lecture, we'll talk about the Reconstruction Era. Um, but what I want to do before we get started really on talking about the, the Civil War is talk about the events that lead up to the Civil War. And if you remember last time we talked about the Mexican-American War and the fact that Texas uh, played a key role in that war with Mexico, which also really increases the tensions as well in um, Texas. So, or in the United States at that time. So Texas becomes the 29th state in the union, and I'll move my, my uh, image there a little bit so you can see the, the entire transcript. Um, but anyway, with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which ends the Mexican-American War, uh, Texas's independence is recognized, and the United States grows by about a third. It adds another third in it, and it realizes this idea of manifest destiny because it completes that mission of, of settling coast to coast. Now, even after the war itself, even though the Rio Grande area was settled, the decision on where to settle northern Texas was still up for dispute. Texas themselves, as you can see from the map, saw themselves as going up all the way up to Wyoming in its northern area. But that wasn't seen that way in, um, in, in the United States. That was kind of a contested border. So the event that really settles um, this disputed land was actually had to do with California. So California, with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, became part of the United States. Um, and they were formerly part of Mexico, and there's all kinds of things that happened to the people that lived there before as well that I won't be able to get into on this. But one thing that does happen shortly after this Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo is the discovery of gold in California. And this, of course, causes what's known as the California Gold Rush. A vast amount of people come to um, California to seek gold. There were people that came from Mexico, South America, Europe, Australia. By, the, by 1860, there were 360,000 people in California at that time. California wants to enter the United States as a free state, okay? And if you remember the whole issue with the Mexican-American War, it was, it was a big issue, right, as um, to this unbalance of power. So a lot of people in the South definitely did not want to see this. So what they do, what um, Henry Clay does, he was a, a leading congressman in the United States at the time, comes up with this idea of the Compromise of 1850. California would enter as a free state, Texas as a slave state, of course. The slave trade itself, not slavery, but the slave trade would be removed from the city of Washington, D.C., the nation's capital. A new, tougher slave, slave law, which arguably is one of the biggest leaders in the um, what leads to the Civil War itself. And the status of the newly acquired land from the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, and this is important, would be done through something called popular sovereignty. So what popular sovereignty was is that it was this belief that the people of that state should determine whether or not the state should be slave state and free state. Sounds like a good idea, but we're going to see that it was probably one of the hashtag worst ideas ever. Okay, which we'll talk about here in just a minute. But just want to give you an idea of Texas's new boundary. You can see here that this is the land um, that they gave up, and that's why we see today's uh, Texas's modern border is now this area here. Now let's talk about the status of indigenous tensions at this time, okay? Um, the buffalo herd is dwindling. Now there's a couple reasons for buffalo herds dwindling. One, one reason was because of the way that the Comanche and other, um, and other groups that used buffalo and depended on the buffalo used buffalo, that a lot of times they used young buffalo that like um, were, you know, breeding at breeding age. And so that was an issue with it. Um, and so we begin to see the buffalo herds dwindling. This is going to cause a lot of, uh, you know, Indian raids to increase as their resources are dwindling. Um, the army, interestingly enough, um, actually used uh, camels in the desert. So because of these like, you know, desert-like characteristics in West Texas, the army actually experiments with it. Um, and the only reason they went away from using camels in West Texas was because of the Civil War. Um, now, what Texas also does is it adds some vacant land 
um, to be used for reservations, and they forced any Indians that were not indigenous to Texas. So these are the ones that were pushed out of like the South and, and Cherokee, any remaining Cherokee that was there as well. And there was also a new Indian agent known as Robert Neighbors. Now he has murdered people, even though he was actually murdered by an Anglo raider, they accuse um, indigenous people of this and, and, and the tension grows and grows um, with the Comanche at this time. There's also continued tension um, regarding uh, Tejanos that lived here. And infamously, there was something known as the Cort Cortina Revolt or the first Cortina War. Because there's a first Cortina War, that means there's gonna be a second one and this is gonna happen during the Civil War itself. Uh, but um, continued Tejanos are, are losing in uh, power and dwindling in numbers. And most Tejanos were in either San Antonio, um, but really mainly in South Texas at this time. There was an incident in Brownsville um, by a man known as Juan Cortina. He was a dispute over land with the person that um, settled the town of Brownsville by the name of Charles Sullivan. But what ended up happening was that Cortina's, um, by the Brownsville sheriff, one of his employees was like mistreated and arrested. And he goes in and raids the jail and pulls the employee out and then he goes down and gathers like 40 to 80 other Tejano men who are angry at this like Anglo takeover at the time. Um, and uh, they go and they, they take over the town of Brownsville for a short time. They were persuaded to leave um, by some emissaries from Mexico. Um, but he interestingly writes a manifesto on all of the wrongs that were done to Tejanos at the time. And it's a really great primary source to look at the heart of many of the Tejanos and seeing uh, their disgruntledness with what happened um, in Texas and how Texas was really taken over at that time. So what was the status of slaves in Texas at that time? You can see that as the Civil War is going to grow, number and the tensions in the United States, numbers of slaves will grow. Take a look just at those numbers. Um, the population, slave population, when Texas joined the Union was um, at a small amount compared to the other Southern states at 30,000. But by 1860, at the start of the Civil War, 183,000, and by the war en war's end, almost doubled that, right at 250,000. It's also important to note that most Texans actually did not own slaves. And if they did, they owned less than three or four. They were very small uh, amount of slave owners. Three quarters of the entire wealth of Texas, though, was held by 60 planters. This is really common throughout the South. Most people in the South actually did not own slaves, which is um, really odd when we think about what happens with the Civil War. It is a war over slavery. And, and how the planters of the South really wielded this amount of wealth is, is also something that's studied by historians and, and frequently misunderstood. Um, but uh, throughout the South and including in Texas, people use the Bible to justify slavery. There's many elements in the Old Testament that actually refer to that. Um, and also the sheer economic dependency. And the, the press itself was also almost making this dividing line in saying, you know, those who denounce slavery as an evil, this is in the Galveston Weekly News, in any sense are enemies of the South. So we see that as, you, you know, Texas itself, the Anglos in Texas are aligning themselves with the South's um, sympathy towards the white plantation owners, okay? Another event has a huge effect on what happens um, in the war itself, and that was the uh, Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. So I'm going to show you a map here in just a minute that shows you this, but essentially um, it throws out the Missouri Compromise of 1820, which had a dividing line, and I'll show that to you again, that said anything north of the Missouri, um, southern Missouri line would be a free state if it's submitted into the Union, anything south of it would become a slave state. And it throws this out completely and it replaces it with, with the idea of popular sovereignty. This is going to be a trigger to increase, huge increase in violence in uh, the United States. And that's because as you can imagine, what's gonna happen when, um, when people know that it's gonna come down to a vote on whether a state's gonna become a slave state or a free state. We already know from our own studies of you know, what happened with the Mexican-American War, the tensions are gonna rise. Abolitionists are gonna send people from the North to go settle in Kansas, 
um, and form their own abolitionist towns. People in the South, in order to push this, um, you know, more of a slaveocracy, right? They're going to send people from the South into Kansas to form their own slave towns as well. And what happens is like a literal mini civil war in tech in Kansas, known as Bleeding Kansas. Okay, this is going to increase tensions throughout the South and is eventually going to be one of the uh, things that leads to the Civil War in, in the United States. Um, and so here's a map that kind of shows you this, um, that, you know, the Kansas Territory right here, this was the area that wanted to become part of, um, that there was going to become, you know, popular sovereignty wanted to become a state. This was the line. So technically speaking, a lot of abolitionists um, and anti-slavery forces in the North were very upset because technically speaking, Kansas was supposed to become a free state, okay? But they throw that out and let them do popular sovereignty. So you can kind of see how those tensions would have risen, okay? Um, a lot of other events, and I'm putting out quite a bit because um, just the amount of time that I have to cover this, but essentially speaking, tensions rise in Texas and throughout the United States. There was vigilante violence in Texas itself. There were actual vigilance committees that were created in Texas to stamp out any anti-slavery uprisings. There was a minister um, uh, by the name of Anthony Blue who was actually hanged because they thought that, oh, there's these fires that are breaking out in, in you know, North Texas and it must be um, you know, a slavery uprising. Turns out just to be weather. Um, but they hanged him anyway, okay? But the real tipping point of um, the actual Civil War was the election of Lincoln in 1860. So he won on something known as the Free Soil Platform. In 1854, the newly formed Republican Party, um, which came from, uh, from the Free Soilers that believed that there should be no slavery on land. They were not abolitionists though, just to clarify that, they just didn't want slavery to with people that wanted to work a wage and um, and also you know very pro-north um, ideology um, Lincoln never said that he was going to get rid of slavery and I want to make sure that I clarify that it's only in the middle of the war that the Emancipation Proclamation is um, created and at that time that is when um, slavery was it turned into you know a war um, it clearly even though it definitely was a war over slavery it, it clearly defined becomes a war over slavery at that point. But um, immediately after Lincoln's election, like a week or two after South Carolina seceded, um, Texans after they see Lincoln's election and what happened in South Carolina, call for a secession convention. Now Houston is absolutely going to not want to, Sam Houston does not want to secede. He's an av av uh, avidly against this idea of secession, but he reluctantly calls the secession convention to tr hopefully thinking that the moderates of the party um, would keep from uh, this from happening, okay? But I wanna show you a map of the war uh, or the election of 1860. And you can see that, you know, uh, what really happens with this is the split of the Democratic Party. And this really came from people that wanted to secede or not wanted to secede or, um, you know, this idea. Uh, so the split of the Democratic Party is really what causes the loss um, of the election um, to the Republican Party, which was a newly formed political party. And uh, what the tension really came from was the fact that not one Southern state had voted, you know, for Lincoln. And so uh, they feel like they need to form their own, um, their own confederacy. And this is really to preserve slavery. OK, and we know that the reason for secession was to uh, was to, you know, um, was to preserve slavery because every secession document from every southern state talks about it, including Texas. And to say that it was not a war over slavery is ahistorical. OK, and so that's really incredibly important when people say to me, oh, it's about states rights and states rights to what? Right. To use um, slaves and to have preserve slavery. Um, but anyway, slipping back to exactly what was done with Texas, and you can click on this link to read the secession document so you can see the reasons for secession by Texas. But essentially, um, they called the convention on January 29th. They voted to secede. 
Um, but the people that show up to this secession convention were mostly landowners. Um, there were 18 counties that voted against it. These are mostly in the northern and central part of Texas. A lot of immigrant populations, specifically German immigrants, did not want to secede. Um, but this was the decision of the Texas voters to secede. And so they escort and give safe passage to 2,000 federal troops out of Texas. It becomes official in uh, 18, March 2nd of 1861. Um, this is a map that really shows the, the order of secession. And you can see the areas of Texas that were against secession. So you can kind of see this. Um, the states of Missouri, Kentucky, and Maryland, although they were technically um, slave states, they don't secede. They're known as border states. And that's going to become important because when the Emancipation Proclamation was issued, um, slavery was still legal in those states. Um, and so that's why the 13th Amendment ended up having to be passed, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so what was Texas like during the Confederacy? By the end of the war, about 100,000 to 110,000 troops from Texas. Most of those were cavalry units. Um, there was one uh, or there was, a, you know, a small amount of Tejanos. Uh, that did support Texas's um, secession. It's led by Colonel Santos Benavides. He commanded about 3,000 Tejanos in a cavalry unit. Um, people that opposed the war in Texas, they e either you know joined the Union and, and left and joined Union forces, or they left Texas altogether. Uh, Texas becomes a staging ground itself for um, for the war. And uh, so uh, not for the war specifically, I'm talking about for the war and the expansion of the Confederacy. So there were a couple attempts to take New Mexico specifically, which was thwarted by the New Mexico governor at that time. But there was it was a staging ground for expansion or what they thought. Uh, but we know the end of the story, right? We know the spoiler report in this. And that is that um, the Confederacy ended up losing the war. Um, but we will talk about its impact a little bit, and then I'll talk about the end of the war. Uh, it does cripple the economy, not as much as other southern states. There was a conscription act done, um, and conscription is a draft. Initially, the conscription only went up to the age of 35, but as the war dragged on, it becomes a war of attrition. Um, there's actually, uh, it, right, they raise the conscription all the way up to the age of 50 for men. Women during the war uh, were engaged in, you know, as nurses, as providing food, um, engaging in homespun goods and things like that. And the Comanches, which will be important, we'll talk about in our next uh, lecture a little bit more, they take advantage of the situation. Um, a lot of resources uh, are, are pushed away and the Comanche raids are continuing through the war. There's really not very many uh, resources that are used to fight Comanches during the war and they really play off this um, at the time. There were people that dissented um, against the war itself. There were a lot of people that were known as conscription or draft evaders. Um, many of the German settlements were staunchly Union supported, one known, very well known, which was Honey Grove. Um, and uh, there was also something known as the Great Hangings in Gainesville, in which 40 men are actually hanged because they were Union sympathizers and um, and it really was this like mayhem that happened. They actually, a jury only found seven, seven guilty, but when um, people asked for more people to be accountable for all the dissension and things that were happening, they ended up um, hanging 40 of them. And so, you know, those were known as the, the, great, end, or the great hangings of Gainesville. Uh, finally, the end of the war, um, Appomattox Courthouse marked the end of the war itself. Um, on April 9th of 1865. General George Granger um, arrived in Galveston, of course, on June 19th of 1865. This is known as Juneteenth. This is when he read the Emancipation Proclamation, which actually was issued and was supposed to be uh, possible two years prior. But as you can imagine, it's not like they had Snapchat or, uh, or you know, Instagram to find out, hey, we're free uh, because of the Emancipation Proclamation. But he reads this um, this short order number three, which was uh, essentially freed the slaves in Texas, which is why we recognize Juneteenth. But there was a lot of confusion regarding it because it essentially encouraged them to stay where they are um, and just and get pay. So stay on the plantations and get pay, which will later be known as sharecropping. And we'll talk more about a little bit later. 
Uh, but hopefully that gave you a little bit of background into Texas's role during the Civil War. In the next lecture, I'll talk about Reconstruction, which is actually very misunderstood time period in American history and Texas's role in place during Reconstruction itself.